The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, smashed by an 18-wheeler. It's probably going to be a body recovery, not a rescue situation. A young man lay in a coma. Lying there and not know if he would ever see his eyes open again. And his parents are told to brace for the worst. There's no way for them to predict what's going to happen. Watch a miraculous recovery. Exits the hospital walking. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Iran is now declaring we didn't do it after the U.S. and other countries claimed an Iranian missile shot down a jetliner. But a new video shows the moment when the missile actually hit the Ukrainian plane. Gary Lane has the story. Western officials now say it's highly likely that Iran was responsible for shooting down a Ukrainian passenger airliner late Tuesday, killing all 176 people on board. The crash occurred just hours after Iran launched a barrage of missiles against U.S. air bases in Iraq. This video shows the moment the Boeing 737 was struck by a missile. An Iranian resident recorded video of the moment the plane crashed to the ground outside Tehran. Iranian media is broadcasting CCTV video that shows debris on fire streaking past the camera. The evidence indicates that the plane was shot down by an Iranian surface-to-air missile. Western intelligence officials say it's likely the Iranians fired off the anti-aircraft missile because they mistook the Ukrainian passenger plane for a possible U.S. fighter jet. Iran has invited officials from Boeing, the U.S. and Canada to investigate. But the U.S. may not want Americans to go to Iran with tensions so high. Just hours after the crash, Iran had cleared all evidence of the accident from the crash zone. The black boxes have been recovered, but it remains unclear if Iran will turn them over to Western investigators. Meanwhile, back in Washington, the House passed the War Powers Resolution, which says the president must inform Congress before taking further military action against Iran. Only three Republicans voted for the measure, eight Democrats against. The resolution is not law, it's non-binding, simply a sense of the House resolution that requires no presidential signature. But House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says the measure has real teeth. She says Trump endangered the lives of American diplomats and service members when he ordered the strike that killed Iranian Quds Force General Qasem Soleimani. The president to say, oh, I inform you by reading my tweets. No, that's not the relationship that our founders had in mind. Pelosi and other Democrat leaders are upset because the president did not inform them prior to taking action against Iran. At a rally in Toledo Thursday night, the president said he had good reason not to tell them about it. You know, these are split-second decisions. You have to make a decision. We didn't have time to call up Nancy, who is not operating with a full deck. The resolution passed after Trump said Soleimani was planning to blow up our embassy in Iraq. Gary Lane, CBN News. Well, welcome to the political theater that is our government today. It just seems that everyone's posturing and campaigning. And this resolution, much like the impeachment, uh, it really doesn't have any meaning. It's not going to go anywhere in the Senate. Uh, if they really wanted to get serious, they need to repeal the War Powers Act of 2002. And uh, I think that has zero chance of getting even through a Democrat-controlled Congress. So all they're doing is making statements. But here's what amazing is amazing to me is how a um, Iranian general, Soleimani, is now somehow being praised as some kind of wonderful hero. I, I don't understand this in any Western media or any political party in the West. Why in the world would you ever praise this man? Here he is. He's, he's known to be a murderer of his own people. Go back to the Green Revolution uh, in Iran, and he's the one who ordered snipers to start shooting on the protesters in that. On top of that, he's the architect of these various militias that have sprung up all over the Middle East, the Shia militias. And in the past few weeks, they are the ones who went after our embassy in Iraq. Uh, so it was a, a counterattack, if you will, to that. We're not going to allow another embassy hostage crisis like occurred back in the 1970s. 
So uh, I don't get it. Uh, why, why would you ever praise this guy? Why would you ever defend him or ask for advance notification uh, from our intelligence services that uh, we, we need to strike and we need to remove him from the scene before he engineers more protests, more militias, as Iran is trying to subvert the government of Iraq? Doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, and it's time to get the politics out of this so that we can actually defend our country. In other news, Iran has several ways to go after its adversaries in the Middle East. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? Gordon, Iran uses militias against countries like Israel, along with U.S. interests in the Middle East. As Chris Mitchell reports, one researcher has spent years studying these groups, and he has an important message for all Americans. Important to look at. Philip Smythe created the Shia Militia Mapping Project, an exhaustive research effort identifying Iranian-backed Shia militias throughout the Middle East. He says they're an extension of Iranian power. They are the spear point for the Iranians. You know, we talk about their nuclear weapon and the nuclear threat that's coming out of Iran, but this is the real nuclear weapon on the ground. This is what affects change in the region. This is what's kept dictators in power that the Iranians have wanted. For instance, Bashar al-Assad. It's the Shia militias that supported him. How do they control Lebanon, Lebanese Hezbollah? Smythe says Qassam Soleimani masterminded these states within states and wove them throughout the region from Iran to Lebanon. But he was a guy on the ground who knew how to build relationships. And not just that, what made him very important was how he was able to delegate to other commanders. He knew who the right people were, who was going to be ideologically loyal, who could be financially loyal. These militia groups number as many as 200,000 and pose a threat to America's number one ally in the Middle East, Israel. A massive one. Uh, this is the tip of the spear for the Iranians uh, in terms of fighting the Israelis. He says Americans should know about these groups and care. Well, they should care because these groups have been consistently threatening the United States and its interests in the region. And ideologically, they hold that the United States needs to not only be out of the region, but religiously speaking, they view the United States as what they call Shaitan al-Akbar, or the greatest Satan. And that's a, a true belief that many of the hardcore ideologues hold. That means they want to take American lives when they view it as strategically advantageous. Based on Smythe's research, it's clear America, Israel, and the West will be dealing with the Shia groups throughout the Middle East for the foreseeable future. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thank you, Chris. Well, back here in Washington, the Supreme Court will take up a Louisiana abortion law in March that pro-life leaders believe could be used to re-examine the legal underpinnings of abortion in America. Paul Strand reports on the renewed push to overturn Roe v. Wade. This is the first big abortion case that new justices Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh get to weigh in on. And many are assuming they're going to give the court a conservative and maybe even pro-life majority. And some 207 lawmakers here on Capitol Hill are asking the court to use this case to reconsider the very rulings, like Roe v. Wade, that gave the nation legalized abortion nationwide. Catherine Glenn Foster helped write the brief those lawmakers signed. This is a case where the court can revisit the Roe v. Wade regime and should revisit that regime. The high court will hear a case from Louisiana that would require abortion doctors to obtain hospital admitting privileges. Opponents of the law say it's incredibly restrictive and it's going to make it hard for Louisiana women to get abortions there. But those who support the law say all it's basically doing is insisting that abortion doctors have admitting privileges to a local hospital in case one of their patients gets into an emergency or has medical complications. There's this exemption for abortion. Uh, it, for, for anyone who's performing an abortion, all of a sudden the same rules don't apply. And really it is a situation where you have an abortion business fighting for the right to abandon their patients. Dr. Lilbach's Westminster Theological Seminary went to court against Obamacare regulations, forcing it to pay for abortion-causing contraceptives. And they said, well, it's easy. You just have to pay $2 million a year in fines. So off to court went the seminary and allied groups like Little Sisters of the Poor. And it ended up going all the way to the Supreme Court. Lilbach believes pro-life legal victories can help land blows against Roe v. Wade. Of course we long for the courts to say Roe v. Wade was a bad decision. You can't find uh, abortion rights in the Constitution. But he says it's more important that everyone keep fighting on all fronts and change the American culture. We're moving in the right direction. And so 
I think our battle is one, one day at a time, one decision at a time, one life rescued at a time. Until we can come to the point where we really can say that America is a pro-life nation. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from the Supreme Court. And Gordon, abortion is expected to be a galvanizing issue come November. Oh, absolutely. This is going to be a political issue, and this is a political case. Uh, at the end of the day, do I think Roe versus Wade is going to be re reversed by this case? The answer is no. Uh, but can there be some protections for the health of women who are seeking abortions? Can you require that their doctors be certified at a hospital? Uh, so that if anything goes wrong, they can be immediately admitted to an emergency room so that you can quickly take care of that problem? Uh, well, that's the question, and I predict that the court will rule in favor of women. Wendy? All right. Well, up next in the news, the race for the White House. What's at stake for Christians? And are we seeing a spiritual battle playing out this election season? Charisma's Steve Strang weighs in. And then... Run over by an 18-wheeler, this young man had broken bones throughout his body. So why was he able to walk out of the hospital a few weeks later? You'll see it later on today's show. A few months ago, Chaplain Patrick Conroy prayed to cast demons out of the House of Representatives. His prayer went viral. That kind of spiritual warfare is exactly what our world needs. Take a look. Since the day Donald Trump was sworn into office, the partisan divide in America has grown deeper and more contentious by the day. The bickering and rancor on Capitol Hill got so bad a few months ago that this prayer by House Chaplain Patrick Conroy about casting out demonic spirits went viral. I now cast out all spirits of darkness from this chamber, spirits not from you. While the concept of spiritual warfare is foreign to many Americans, Stephen Strang, author and CEO of Charisma Media, says it's critical for Christians to look at what's going on in the country with spiritual eyes. He calls on Christians to respond to the spiritual warfare taking place in the nation, to rise up and pray, and to fully understand what's at stake. Well, Steve Strang, the CEO of Charisma Media and the author of the upcoming book, God, Trump, and the 2020 Election, joins us now. And Steve, it's great to have you with us. Thank you for the privilege. Let's talk about it. Spiritual warfare. Uh, in my lifetime, I've never heard of a chaplain uh, standing up and casting demons out of a chamber of the House of Representatives. But what, what started all of this? Well, the Bible did, because, of course, the Bible tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And normally we uh, ignore that until something really bad happens, uh, you know, a terrible war, a terrible mass murder. And then people say, well, this is evil personified, but it's really principalities and powers. And I think that it explains what's going on in our country, where there's just uh, tremendous hatred and animosity. And I'm glad that he did what he did. And he's not the only one. Uh, Paula White Kane um, was at a political rally and got up and prayed against uh, demonic networks. And the media says she was calling the news networks demonic. And she really wasn't. Yeah. She was using terminology. And I've, I've written about this. I did a podcast called, um, it, uh, the subject was spiritual warfare and the impeachment. And I and it was the biggest podcast I've ever had. It really hit a chord. And it really all I said was what I'm saying to you. The Bible says we wrestle not against uh, flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. It is not Republicans versus Democrats. I believe that it's really good versus evil. And the Bible says that, the, that Satan is the father of all lies. And we know there's all kinds of lying going on. And the hatred, I think it's the only, people say, why is this happening? I think that you have to look at it through spiritual eyes and understand that there's demonic forces behind it. And we as Christians who uh, try to live by the power of the Holy Spirit have authority just as this chaplain did. You don't have to be a clergyman. We can pray. And I try to encourage in the, in the different me media that I have for people to pray and to intercede and to pull down you know, what we believe are demonic strongholds over this nation. I think that in a lot of ways, uh, Christians have the power to shift things in this country. 
Well, I, I, we absolutely have that power. We have that authority. I'm not sure if we're recognizing uh, the tactic here. And I think the tactic is quite plain. He's seeking to divide us. Uh, when you have unity, uh, when they are of one accord, uh, when brethren dwell together in unity, there's wonderful things that happen from that. Uh, but we seem to be an, a nation divided, and you can't even engage in spiritual warfare. Here's, uh, you know, you, you mentioned what Paula did. She she called it for what it was. That these are demonic networks, and suddenly every news organization in in in, in America is saying, "Well, you're talking about us," <laughs> and, and it wasn't. They were, they just got offended. They didn't look at well, what's the spiritual, what's the scriptural background for what she's doing. Well, of course, there's spiritual warfare against all of us, all the time, everywhere. And Satan does try to divide. I mean, that's why there's so much divorce. That's why there's so much, even problems in churches and, and so forth. And, and it's manifesting itself in our nation um, in ways that we haven't seen in a long, long time. I personally believe that a lot of this stuff has been uh, under the surface for a long time, and I believe uh, that Donald Trump, for good or for bad, has brought a lot of this stuff to the surface that was already there. Because this stuff did not start in this administration. It's been going on for years. And our whole culture is going away from Ju uh, Judeo-Christian values, as you well know. Uh, it's going away from the Bible. It, se it used to be that uh, you know, people we would call born-again Christians were the majority. We're not the majority anymore, but we're a very strong uh, plurality. And it's time for Christians to stand up, take our spiritual authority, and, and really intercede for this nation. Well, what do you think it's going to take to wake Christians up? Because that's, that's my primary concern. It seems that even Christians today are divided about the president. And I'm more concerned about what's happening in the Middle East today. I'm more concerned about what's happening in China. China has taken some very anti-Christian stands, and uh, it doesn't seem to be causing any kind of wrinkle at all. Uh, it, it's, it's even rarely reported. What, what, what will it take to really wake up Christians to say, if we don't start interceding, if we don't start pleading for unity, um, that we're actually going to be our own worst enemies. Well, things have to get pretty bad before people wake up, and mm. things are pretty bad, and a lot of people have woken up or are in the process of waking up, but not everyone. You're absolutely right. And I hope we don't wait until we get a socialist government or whatever, or until we get into a war with China to wake up and understand. I hope that what's happening now is a wake-up call. You said it very well, and uh, Christians have to take our authority. And also, there are a lot of Christians that aren't really that serious about their Christianity. Mm. You know, they need to get serious about God. They need to get into the Word and pray. And, and uh, we, all, we always know that persecution uh, purifies the church. And in our country, we've had such great liberty, such great freedoms for so long that we take a lot of it for granted. And there's an awful lot of lukewarm Christians. And, uh, but, but those who do perceive spiritually, who's, um, who have been awakened spiritually, need to take the lead. And I admire what you're doing and what CBN is doing, um, you know, day in and day out. It's not just happened recently. I mean, you've been, uh, you, where, where else on TV do people give words of wisdom? Words, or, 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 words or of knowledge. Yeah. That's right. And, but you do here, and, um, and you're making a tremendous impact. Well, I'm concerned. I, I appreciate what you're doing. I'm concerned that the left is going far. I never thought I'd see a socialist candidate uh, have a legitimate shot at a presidential nomination. At the same time, I never thought I'd see the reawakening of white nationalism. And all of it just seems that the polls are getting farther and farther apart. And we're losing sight that, you know, just our, our pledge that, you know, we need to be united together. One and nation Christ under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice and for all. And we Christians need to not only oppose what's happening on the left, which is horrible, I agree, but, but we need to come against um, white nationalism, the anti-Semitism that's come up. You know, all of this is spiritual warfare, and hopefully people's eyes are starting to be opened. Okay. Well, the book is called God, Trump, and the 2020 Election. There's a whole chapter on spiritual warfare and how you can get started in it. It's available wherever books are sold, and it will be sales start on January 14th. Steve, thank you. Thank and you. God bless you.
Wendy, over to you. All right, thanks, Gordon. Still ahead, tormented by suicidal thoughts from the time he was just 10 years old. What saved his life through five different attempts? But first, a terrible car crash. Doctors expected scans of the victim's brain to look like dog food. What did they see instead? Stay tuned for an amazing recovery. Charlie was alive, but just barely. His car had been hit by an 18-wheeler. Even the EMTs on the scene thought they'd be pulling out a dead body. The report from the hospital was just as grim. With their son in a coma, Charlie's parents could only hold on to hope and a fourfold promise from God. June 24, 2016. EMT Greg Clark and the Fort Worth Fire Department responded to an accident involving a car and an 18-wheeler. We were first ones to arrive, and sure enough, a large truck T-boned another vehicle, hit him in the driver's side door. My immediate thought was, it's probably going to be a body recovery, not a rescue situation. Amazingly, they found the driver, 23-year-old Charles Priest, unconscious but alive. He was airlifted to Texas Health Fort Worth Hospital in critical condition. Moments later, his mother, Cherie, drove up on the accident. It, it was unbelief. What am I looking at? What am I saying? Is, is this really him? At that point, I think all the emotions turned off, and it was the matter of you got to get to your son. After an officer filled her in, Cherie went home and picked up her younger son, Texas, and husband, Chuck, speeding towards the hospital they prayed. Okay, God, what's going on? You know, is he going to be okay? I was just praying that, it, that God was going to be in the midst of it. When the family arrived at Texas Health Fort Worth, they learned Charles was in a coma. Dr. Mohammed Siadati was one of the medical staff caring for Charles. CAT scans revealed severe head injury, neck injury, broken ribs, blood in the chest, broken pelvis, his head injury was the most severe one. And there is micro tears. It's damage at cellular level that not necessarily obvious. To see your son lying there and not know if you would ever see his eyes open again and not know if you would ever hear him talk again. It was just overwhelming, heart-wrenching. Although hoping for the best, Doctors could make no guarantees. And it was those kind of things. If he survives, if he wakes up, and we don't know when, and there's nothing, and there's no way for them to predict what's gonna happen. As the staff worked round the clock, friends and family gathered to pray, holding on to hope. I may never get to speak to him again. I, I may never get to see him again. We may never get to laugh together again thought I was about to lose my son. After three days, it was clear Charles would live, but he still faced the possibility of several permanent disabilities. His fractured neck might require surgery, severely limiting his mobility. But doctors' main concern was the elevated cranial pressure. The longer it remained, the more brain damage it could cause. His parents feared their son would never be the same. I mean, there was absolutely nothing we could do um, except for praying and, and, for, and trusting in the Lord. Pleading with Father and asking Him to, 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 to allow us to have another day to play basketball. Alone in the waiting room one evening, Cherie says she was praying when the Lord gave her a promise. I was sitting in the waiting room and I was looking out the window. I saw a dark cloud out in the distance. When I saw that cloud, and he took me back to Psalms 18. And it's just a beautiful passage. It starts out with, my cry came to the Lord's ear, and he heard me. The next several verses describe nature responding because he got up and he came to my rescue. And the Lord gave me those four things, that he's gonna wake up, he's gonna know who God is, he's gonna know who our family is, and he's gonna run. 
A week later, Charles' cranial pressure stabilized, and the doctors took him for an MRI. The family waited for the results. They said, what we expect is for his brain to look like dog food. And then they put the images up on the screen, and the image of his brain is a healthy brain. And the doctors were surprised. They didn't expect to see it intact that way. Over the next several days, Charles started waking up from the coma, responding to verbal commands. To the staff, it was a great improvement. To the family, it was confirmation that God was answering their prayers. The doctor would come in and say, we're going to do a breathing test, but don't, don't be shocked, it's gonna take him a while. And then a couple of days, he's breathing on his own. And within a week, he's eating solid food. Only six weeks after the accident, he exits the hospital walking. Then after wearing a neck brace for four months, he was released by doctors with no surgery and no medical restrictions. So when it was done, it was done. I was the last part of my recovery. And for me to walk away from that with no restrictions, there's no way that I can look at any of the stuff that happened to me and realize it's not a miracle. Charles not only finished his college degree, he was deemed physically and mentally fit to pursue his dream and serve in the Texas National Guard. God is who he says he is. God will do what he says he will do. And if I doubt that, all I have to do is go look at my son. He's not good because of the healing. He's good regardless of whether or not my son was healed. He revealed himself to us in this, and all I, all I can do is say thank you. All you can do is say thank you. And that's one of the best places to be, is that you let your request be made known with thanksgiving. You don't thank him for the problem. You don't thank him for the accident. You thank him for what he's about to do, because when you do that, you show how much you believe. Realize God still speaks today. He's not, he's not silent. He wants to give you hope. He wants to give you faith. He wants to give you healing. Now, for that wonderful mother, she's in prayer, and God gives her four promises, four promises of recovery. The doctors are saying, the, the, I'm sorry, the brains should be mush. It, it, there's, there's no hope here. But God gave her hope. And with that, he gave her son healing, and they held on to that hope. They held on to the promise. And you today hold on to the promise that Jesus, that God, he will forgive all your iniquities. He cleanses you from all of them. He comes to you and says, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, yet they will be white as snow. He is able to present you in his presence without spot. All you have to do is turn to him ask for that forgiveness. Second, forgive anyone just as you have been forgiven. Forgive anyone who has ever harmed you. And then here's the next promise. He heals all your diseases. So look at your disease and say, well, you're part of all. <laughs> you're all the diseases. And Jesus has already healed. So you must leave right now. Just have that faith to believe and let God do all the rest because he stands by his word to perform it. And his eyes are going to and fro over the whole earth to show himself strong to those whose hearts are loyal to him. He's looking for faith. He wants to break forth. He wants to break forth into your body, into your life. He knows you. He numbers the very hairs on your head. You are precious in his sight. Get all of that set and we're going to pray. Before we pray, here's another miracle. Sharon of Cannon City, Colorado. She had arthritis, a torn meniscus. She had horrible pain, both knees. She used a cane to help her walk. Everything changed one day while watching the 700 Club. Sharon placed her hands on both her knees as the hosts were praying. Wendy said, someone has terrible knee problems that have not been healed. You're putting your hands on your knees right now and you're crying out to God, receive your healing. 
At that moment, Sharon was healed. She is now pain-free and cane-free. She gets to <laughs> walk on her. That is a wonderful miracle. That really Hallelujah. is. Praise God. Well, here's one, Gordon. For months, Natalia of Margate, Florida, suffered from painful dental issues. She was having a difficult time chewing most food. Natalia was watching the 700 Club, and she heard you address her problem specifically during prayer. She knew the word was for her, and by faith she claimed it. Her pain disappeared instantly. Natalia can now eat everything, even carrots, without any pain. <laughs> Let's claim it. Let's claim it. Let's go boldly to the throne of grace and claim what God has promised. It's for you. Let it be manifest in your life and in your body right now. Lord, we lift the needs of the audience to you. And as people are laying hands, laying hands on that area of the body that needs healing, we join together with them. Mm -hmm. We say over them now, be healed. Be made whole from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. All disease must leave now. All infirmity must leave now. All pain must leave now. You have borne our infirmity. You have taken away our pain. We receive it now. We receive your sacrifice for us. There's someone you heard the story about a woman laying hands on both knees. You're laying your hand on your right knee. And God is reconstructing things in that knee. You just felt something move within it. And that's the hand of God reaching down, touching, healing, restoring the joint. What the doctors say can't be done, God is doing right now for you. Realize you can now put weight on that joint. You can now move that joint. You can now stand up and have the confidence that you are healed. In Jesus' name, be healed, be made whole. Wendy? There's someone, you've recently had dental implants and they are extremely painful and it's almost like your body is fighting them and having some sort of reaction and um, almost like an allergic reaction and infection. God, uh, God sees it. God has heard your cry for help and he is healing you today that your body is going to adjust and those dental implants are going to be fine. Just start praising him because it's done in Jesus' name. Uh, there's someone with a scalp condition that's embarrassing and, and you're not even praying, you're not even asking for it, you're not even thinking about it mm -hmm. until I just said you've got this scalp condition. God's healing that for you. He's taking it all away. Some, someone else, you have a condition in your eyes where um, you, you don't have uh, normal um, uh, like oil secretions on your eyelids and it's scratchy, it's painful. Um, crusty. God is healing all of that. He's taking it all away, restoring it. You're going to be able to blink and no pain. You're going to be able to have, have new life. Uh, it's very embarrassing for you. God's healing it right now in Jesus' name. There's someone is your, your right index finger and it's like it's crippled or it's all bent up and it just happened like overnight and you don't even know what happened. God is straightening that out and your finger is going to be fine in Jesus' name. Uh, someone, you've got a, a strained tendon in, in the left leg, um, and it, it just seems to go through the knee and down into the calf. God's healing that and just restoring it, restoring it all the way down to the sole of your foot and Achilles tendons being restored. God is healing you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for the blood shed for us. We thank you for who you are, for you are the Savior. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. If you need prayer, we're here for you. We're here for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we love to stand with you in prayer. We believe in prevailing prayer. So if you need prayer, call us. 1-800-700-7000. If you've had a miracle, call us. Let us know. Let us share your good report. 1-800-700-7000. Wendy? Well, still to come, a mother to 90 orphans diagnosed with cancer. Where will she turn for help? And what will happen to all of her children? Then a major death wish. This suicidal man planned to be dead by 30. So why is he still alive today? Find out later on today's 700 Club.
Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. Brazil's Supreme Court is allowing a Netflix to show a movie depicting Jesus as a gay man, overruling a lower court judge in Rio de Janeiro who ordered the movie removed after a Catholic group protested. The movie is called The First Temptation of Christ. Its creators defended it as legitimate freedom of expression. The lower court judge said removing the movie was beneficial to all Brazil because of the country's overwhelmingly Christian population. Well, the Venezuelan refugee crisis is still displacing hundreds of families. The native Yucpa tribe has been forced to form a makeshift camp in neighboring Colombia. Families lived in cramped quarters, pieced together with tarps and tree branches, and food and water are hard to come by. The tribe, mostly in desperate need of medical help, benefited from Operation Blessing's free medical brigade. It gave critical care, including ultrasounds, medicine, and basic health checkups. Thanks to Operation Blessing's faithful partners, medical brigades like this one bring health care to families who need it most all over the world. Well, to learn more about Operation Blessing, go to OB.org. Gordon and Wendy will be back with more today's 700 Club right after this. Brenda is a mother to 90 orphans in Uganda. She was once an orphan herself, living on the streets. So when Brenda was diagnosed with cancer, she worried about what would become of her children. But not anymore, thanks to Orphan's Promise. As the rain falls in Uganda, Brenda and her 90 children take shelter in their new home. Orphan's Promise helped them move here after their previous landlord gave them an eviction notice. The old house was really run down. The landlord was a Muslim and didn't like that we were praying and singing gospel songs. At times, we only had one meal each day or nothing at all. Brenda was used to having hardship in her life. When she was young, she lost both her parents and lived on the streets. I don't want any child to go through what I went through. With the help of Orphan's Promise, Brenda provides children here with a safe home, three meals per day, and an opportunity to get an education. Seeing them happy brings me so much joy. On Sundays, we sit under the tree and talk about God's goodness and what He has done for us. All of the wonderful work Brenda does almost came to an end when she got breast cancer. I had painful headaches and felt sick most of the time. When the doctors told me I had cancer, I didn't even know what that was. They said I needed immediate surgery, but there was no way I could afford it. When we learned about Brenda's illness, we covered all her medical bills, including multiple surgeries and chemotherapy and radiation treatment. Today, she is cancer free. Nothing is impossible for God. Because you saved my life, you saved the lives of all my children too. Without you, they'd all be back on the streets and have no one to take care of them. Now I can give them a life I never had. Thank you, CBN, and thank you, CBN Partners. May God bless all of you abundantly. Well, if you're a CBN partner, I love what Brenda said. She said, you not only saved her life, but you saved all of those children, all of those orphans are going to have a better life because of you. If you would like to be a part of helping people like Brenda and others all over the world and right here at home, we want to make it easy for you to do that today. Just go to your phones. The number's right on your screen. 1-800-700-7000 is a toll-free number. Just give us a call and say, I want to give. I want to give whatever you can give. It's $20 a month is what it takes to become a CBM partner. That's just 65 cents a day. We have many levels here. But when you do, please ask for Pledge Express. That's where your bank does all the work. And you don't have to worry about signing a check or stamping an envelope. And it's just very convenient. When you do that, we want to send you Power for Life. This is Gordon and Pat's monthly teaching. This will really encourage your faith. It's our gift to you when you sign up for Pledge Express and become a partner with us. We hope you will. Well, up next, a survivor of five different suicide attempts. Why did he want to take his own life? And what ultimately saved it? Hear his encouraging story when we return.
Josh started having suicidal thoughts when he was just 10 years old. His dad and his brother were also suicidal, and both of them ended their own lives. Josh himself attempted suicide six times until he had a vision that gave him a reason to live. The poorest places, no heating or air, broken glass everywhere, rarely open blinds, really, really dark. Depression was commonplace in Josh Marsengill's world. Growing up in a small, poverty-stricken town in South Carolina, he, his older brother, and father struggled to find hope. The world wasn't good. It was hard. And my idea was that life was pretty terrible and pretty much a curse on all of us. Hope was in a very short supply. As he grew older, his thoughts became darker. Somewhere between 10 and 13, I'm all the way into suicidal thoughts. I don't remember a day that I didn't, like it was, it was every single day. His mother took him to church. Even there, Josh felt a profound sense of failure. Everyone saying if we continued to sin, then we would go to hell. Life is painful enough. If I'm going to hell, why would I spend time in church for a God that's never gonna help me? Josh quieted his thoughts of suicide with typical teenage rebellion. Cigarettes, drugs, and drinking. But the quiet ended shortly after he turned 15. My father committed suicide. That was dark and difficult. My dad was my best friend. It was uh, maybe six weeks after my dad committed suicide that I attempted suicide for the first time. Two weeks later, he was returning from a mental institution after slicing his wrists. Josh dropped out of school and dove into drugs and sex to quiet his ever-present thoughts of suicide and a growing sense of failure. Instead of the thoughts talking to me, they're screaming at me. They feel more real and more close. I remember telling a lot of people that I would be dead before I was 30. One day, while working a part-time job at a video store, his manager suggested he try going to college. Whoa, like how could somebody think that I, someone like me could go to college? It was a glimmer of hope and thought, oh, I, I think I should try that. Josh went on to get his GED and enrolled in community college. But at age 20, he received some all too familiar news. I get a call that my brother had committed suicide, you know, just devastating, realizing that he was completely gone, he would never be back. But the interesting thing was, is that that morning, uh, my brother and I shared a moment. He said, hey, Josh. And I said, yeah. And he said, um, man, I just want you to know I love you. Josh would attempt to take his own life five more times in the coming few years. At the same time, he poured himself into his studies, believing a degree and a good job would ultimately prove he had worth and wasn't a failure. My biggest enemy was poverty, and the college, just, it, it felt like an opportunity to create a better life. Josh's hard work paid off, and in 2007, he graduated top of his class with an MBA and landed a dream job at a Fortune 500 company. In the end, it did nothing to ease his troubled heart and mind. In every respect, I was successful. It was every dream that I had ever been able to have for myself. And then I'm still feeling like empty inside and like um, just everything's worthless. I remember just sitting there in my downtown apartment and I'm crying and just feeling completely defeated. And so I said, God, if you're real, would you please just do away with me? Would you please take my life? Josh says it was then he had a vision filled with attacking demons and encouraging saints. At one point, a man appeared to him and offered to take his pain away. Josh knew the man was Jesus. I thought, wow, who is Jesus? Like, how, how did I miss this about him? He's staring at me with these kind eyes, and he's like, Josh, I can take it from here. Though Josh wasn't sure exactly what to make of the vision, he was about to find out. He quit his stressful, unfulfilling job, and shortly after, he went to a church to hear a friend, a pastor. My friend began giving a message about a relationship with Jesus. I mean, it just had to have been a, 
what God had planned for me to hear. I, I, I ran up to him afterwards and I grabbed him by his shoulders and I'm like shaking him. You have to help me have a, have a relationship with Jesus. And uh, I accepted Christ that day and it was wonderful. I felt re release. And it just felt like maybe God does have a plan for my life. Josh began building a new life in Christ and says within the year, God delivered him from his depression and all suicidal thoughts. There was no presence of anxiety, and I, I was able to hold on to peace, and just grab a hold of like the presence of God. Today, Josh is on staff at his church and runs the Bibles for All ministry with his wife, Mary. He no longer feels like a failure, and instead is grateful to have peace in Jesus. Just to think about the reality that Jesus had taken me as, as this broken, hurting child and uh, had brought me into such a place. It was everything I'd ever wanted. I just realized that, wow, life is meaningful. Life is meaningful. And it's meaningful when you have Jesus in your life. And here's his promise. I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. It's the enemy that wants to try to convince you that existence means suffering, that it, it, as long as you're existing, that you're going to be suffering. You're going to be disappointed. Things aren't going to work out for you. And uh, it, it's bad now and, and wait for the future because it's going to get worse. These are all lies. And there lies from spiritual forces, spiritual beings that have the ability to put thoughts in your head, thoughts in your heart. And it's when you cherish those thoughts that when you receive them, you bring them in and you start mulling them over, that suddenly the thought becomes a feeling, the feeling becomes uh, a habit, and then you're into despair. And then you're wondering, how can I go on? How can, how can anything good come of what I'm doing or who I am? And whether it's your own thoughts or a thought that was planted in you by a parent or a teacher, something that happened in your childhood, you keep going back to it, you keep having that. All you have to do is what Josh did. It's a very simple prayer. His was out of desperation. And I, I don't urge you to take the second part of his prayer, but take the first part. Jesus, if you're real. Now, Josh added to it, take me from this. But the first part, Jesus, if you're real. And he prayed that with all of his heart. And then he had a vision of the spiritual forces that were arrayed against him, but then a vision of the spiritual forces that were for him. Jesus showed up. So God, if you're real, Jesus, if you're real, Jesus shows up. When you ask, he will show up for you. This isn't something that you, you know, joke God with. This isn't something you do casually. When you seek me with all of your heart, then you'll find me. And for Josh, it was a revelation. I've got this from here. You know, if you, if you just let me, I've got this, Josh. I can take care of you. Jesus is saying that to you. If you just let me, I've got this. I can take you to a new place, new relationships, new feelings, new thoughts, a hope, a purpose. I can show you all of these things. That's what happened to John. And then God sent him a messenger after his own heart, and that's promised in the Bible as well. God will do that for you. He'll send people to you who will be able to show you the way to walk. If you want this, don't turn away. Don't let another day go by where you let those thoughts dominate your mind. Let Jesus in. Let him renew your mind and have the future that he planned for you. Pray with me. Jesus. That's right. Say his name. Say it out loud. Jesus. I want to know you. I want to know that you're real. So Jesus, will you show up for me? 
I'm seeking you right now with all of my heart. Be with me. Forgive me. Show me the way forward, the path to you. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed with me, there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to let somebody know. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word from Psalms. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. 